Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now the word baptize there is the word baptizo, the Greek word baptizo. And to anyone who understands Greek, there is no way that word can be confused for anything other than immersion. That word means immersion. And immersion is um, a two-way thing. You either you get an object and fully put it in water, totally covered, submerged in water, that's immersion. Or you put water over something, but total, totally, totally drenched in water, not, or drenched in whatever, not, not, not partially, praise the Lord. So when, when, he says, but when he says, baptize them, this is what he was meaning. And we see that in the Bible, we see that there is no time the word baptism was used and it was just something that was partial. It was something that was real. It was immersion. And it is believed that this is, it is in the English Bible, especially the King James, this is what we call transliteration. It was not translated. It was, it was just transliterated, like from Greek and made an English word. But there is no English word like that. So it, is, it was just taken from baptizo, to baptized and I don't know what is accurate but there is there is there is a belief that it is because the church of England at that time the Anglican church was not immersing people so it would really be against them if they interpreted the word as immersing people so the word had become a, a religious word a, a, a church word you get it but baptism originally had nothing to do with religion or church Actually, initially, it was a trade word. They used to dye fabric. So when they put that fabric in dye, that is what baptizo was for. It was to immerse dye in fabric. And dye was, I mean fabric in dye. So they used to put, so it, it, it just meant immersion. There's nothing, it was not a spiritual word. So I don't know if that's very accurate, but many scholars believe that, that when the Bible now was being translated into English at that time, even during the, uh, there was an earlier English translation, but the King James is the one that really got prominence. It was during the reign of King James, and they, they may have feared this will go against what we do, because by that time they already do this. This will go against what we do, so we better transliterate it, and it will just seem to be a spiritual word, which is not... Many words, there are many words that we see in the Bible that today when somebody says those words, they sound to be spiritual. They sound to be words that are to do with Christianity, but they were never. You see, like we talk about reconciliation, which reconciliation is an accounting word, and it has always been that way. So normally when you say reconcile, you know, people just think it is to bring people together and what, but reconciling was originally in a lot. Still in accounts you do, you reconcile the books, you do all that. It's, it's to, to, to bring things to balance, praise the Lord. And just a, a number of phrases, that is why I normally say that as we preach the gospel, it is so important for us to understand what we are saying so that we don't just speak things, you see, like it is called Christianese. You see, you go and ask somebody, are you saved? You see, what does saved mean? So it's just become a, it's become a, a word of Christianese. So even many Christians don't even understand what it means that they are saved. Saved from what? Are you born again? So when these people were speaking these words initially, early, they were not speaking them as religious words. They spoke them as literal words. When Jesus is saying, Are you, you must be born again, he was meaning, yeah, there must be a second birth. So today we just say, I'm born again. It means you belong to a certain sect of people. It means you belong to a certain group of people. So it's the same way we say baptize. Yeah, have you been baptized? Have you? So we say it as a religious term. But you see, to the Greek, if we use the original word, to them they would understand, have you been immersed? So maybe they would ask, immersed in what? And to what? Because you, you realize in the word of God that every baptism was to something. It was into, but to something also. Praise the Lord. And this is not, like I've said, I will not go into the details. But there are things that I will hint on. But as you go through the discipleship classes, you will be taught all this. But this... The baptism that Jesus talks about is totally different from the baptism of John. It is not the baptism of John. The baptism of John was a baptism unto repentance. So it was in water, but it was a baptism to repentance, unto repentance. Hallelujah. And 
this, the Christian baptism, the Christian water baptism is not a baptism unto repentance. It is a baptism after you've repented. Praise the Lord. And he used, John used to call them and baptize them. And he used to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Now when we preach the kingdom of God is at hand, you get born again. Then you're baptized because you are in the kingdom. You see, the kingdom would be at hand. So for them to get, in, to get, to, to, to get prepared for this kingdom, because Jesus Christ had not yet died, to give them that permission, that free way to get into the kingdom, John baptized them and they were, they were the, in the law and according to the, to the statutes they had that time given by God. They were better. They were better than these other people. There was, it was an outward thing that showed they were better than these other people. Then Jesus came and baptized, and I've heard this a lot in many churches. They say, why do we baptize? To fulfill all righteousness. No. It is Jesus who had to fulfill all righteousness. None of us is meant to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. That is why we receive righteousness. And so you don't see any other person in the Bible baptized to fulfill all righteousness. It is only Jesus. He said, this must be done to fulfill all righteousness. And that is why you say that when he came, he came to put the law to rest. He came to fulfill the law. So this was part of it. To fulfill, to put it to rest. To wind it up. Praise the Lord. To say this is a done deal. A new dispensation comes. Hallelujah. Because Jesus was not a sinner. Why is he baptized in the baptism of repentance to fulfill all righteousness. He was doing it for us. And that is why you see that in Acts 19, when Paul meets these people and they had received the baptism of John, Paul baptizes them again because that was not the Christian baptism. He would not have baptized them, but he baptizes them again in Acts chapter 19 because the baptism they had received was the baptism of John. He baptizes them again and... and we are in the series, the, the, the Holy Ghost. On Thursday, I'll be talking about baptism in the Holy Ghost. So important. We'll understand that also. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. Totally different thing from baptism in water and all this. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. But here we baptize you because you have received him. Who was to come? He already came. You have received him. And that's how you see when Jesus came, his ministry took off. The ministry of John had to win. It was no longer relevant. Verse 5. When they had this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Now there is a lot of quotation here, especially in many churches. You know, they will say, you see, Paul baptized them in the name of Jesus. I think even Peter Jesus said in Matthew, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I like, but we never see that happening. You baptize them in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a contention there. Praise the Lord. But you see, what I believe is that as long as the person is understanding why, why they are being baptized, hallelujah, why they are being baptized. Because you see, others will write this off because they say, no one is baptized in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But... Jesus said, you will baptize them. So what was Jesus referring to also? Hallelujah. And the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the same name. Jesus has been given the name that's above every other name. So if you're baptizing in the name of Jesus, it's okay. It's in the stead of Jesus. That's what in the name means. In the stead of Jesus. And of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is Jesus who took our place. It is his place that we take. Praise the Lord. We don't take the place of the Father. We don't take the place of the Holy Spirit. We take the place of the Son. So I, I, I believe it is just, it is something that is very shallow to debate about. Praise the Lord. Yes, I believe if you baptize them in the name of Jesus, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're good to go. As long as they've understood why they are being baptized. Hallelujah. Uh, so from Matthew 28, 19, we see that it's a command. It's an instruction that Jesus gives to us. He didn't say you may baptize. He didn't say, and you see someone may say, so I'm not born again if I've not been baptized. No, it is just like it's a command to read the word of God. It's a command to study his word. 
Are you not born again if you don't study his word? No, you're born again. It is just like if you're, you're part of a school and they say it's a must to do exams in this school. If you don't do exams, are you not a student? But who is losing? Is it the lecturer? It is you. So there are many commands that he's given to us, especially in the New Testament also, because many people say, oh, the New Testament has no commands. No, Jesus himself says, my command I give unto you, a new command. There, there are commands of the New Testament. They are totally different from the Old Testament because the ones of the New Testament have a self-fulfilling ability in them. But there are commands and there are instructions that we should obey even in the New Testament. And he tells us to do this in Acts 2, 37, 38. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. And that was the order for them. Somebody got born again, they baptized them, and after they baptized them, they got them filled with the Holy Ghost. And when they got them filled with the Holy Ghost, they took communion. That was the order of the early church. Praise the Lord. It is so sad that now in church we take communion on Easter, then you take communion the other day. Then you, we don't talk about people being baptized in the Holy Ghost or filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know many Christians who have been in church, they've been in church for more than 12 years and no one has told them about being filled with the Holy Ghost. These were very crucial things in the early church. And maybe that's why we are seeing the powerless church like we see. That is why we see many Christians and uh, the most powerful thing they did is that they are regular in church. But there is no power to show in their life. The early church was a church full of power. Praise the Lord. It was a church where God could rely on any person from the church, not necessarily the priests or the, the pastors, the prophets. That is why Saul, who turned Paul, encounters him on the way to Damascus and is blind for three days. But he does not send him to a pastor. He does not send him to a prophet. He sends him to a certain disciple named Ananias. He sends him to a regular believer. Because he knew this believer carried power. And this believer had a relationship with the Holy Ghost that the Holy Ghost could also speak to him and tell him, you're going to meet Saul. And you'll pray for him and his eyes shall be opened and he will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Today, the average Christian thinks that's the work of a pastor. The average Christian thinks it's the pastor who can pray for people, for eyes to be opened, for them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is why I love this ministry. Praise the Lord. That's why I love Red Sea. <laughs> I love it that... These things are happening amongst us and not, not necessarily from this side. That's how we are able to go for the missions without the pastor and we expect results because these are for those that believe. They are for those that believe. So Peter preached a message and these guys are like, what must we do? And he told them they should be baptized. In Acts 8, 35 to 38, then Philip opened his mouth and began to began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. This is Philip with the eunuch. And later he's referred to as Philip the evangelist. And you see, that is the role of the evangelist. It is to preach Jesus. To preach Jesus. And you will see that so consistent with Philip. When he preached to the eunuch, when he preached in Samaria, it's always said he preached Jesus. Today we have many people that call themselves evangelists, but they preach everything apart from Jesus. And by the end they say, sell. Yes, Ubuana. That's the only time you hear Jesus. Preaching Jesus is the key. Praise the Lord. There is enough power. Let me tell you, the gospel is not for, it is not for moral modification. It is for regeneration. It is for a new birth. Definitely the new birth will come with a change in morals. Praise the Lord. But you can preach moral modification. And how many people do we know around us who morally look upright, but inside their hearts they are stinking? They are... Praise the Lord. Because it's the easiest thing to do is to put on a moral show, to put on an outward show. So if we preach to people that, many people are going to change. Then they are going to be confused. You know, as... I was talking to somebody recently and I was telling him, there are things that we've preached because we've preached them and then they shock the rest of the world. Somebody grows up 
Let me say, when I was a kid, very early, because of the Pentecostal church I was in, when you men are not meant to play tear, you get what I'm saying? Then we go for a crusade. And there are these American men with plated hair. And so as a kid, five years old, I'm like, okay, God gave permission to if you're white, you can play. You know, I started realizing that these lines are so blurry. Like God is not clear with what he wants to do. You get it? Then you're told drinking alcohol takes you to hell. You get what I'm saying? Then you go to certain countries after preaching, you ask pastor, will you have a beer? Will you have this? Will you have this? And these are Holy Ghost filled people who love God, fully love God. Then you're like, okay, here it's okay for them to drink. The other side, God punishes us with fire. You get what I'm saying? So you realize that why have we majored on many of these things? I'm not, I don't support drinking. I don't support... I've ever drunk. There's nothing good about it. But what, 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 what I'm saying is that some of these things we've preached are not the gospel. So we've emphasized on the trivial things. And at times we've emphasized on our biases, the things that you feel that are good. And that's how parents threaten their children. They threaten them with hell over everything. Instead of preaching the right... And so when this person starts hearing the real gospel, they are confused at first. I told you this. When I started speaking in tongues filled with the Holy Ghost, no one prayed for me. Then I tried to smoke, and when I smoked, I tried to speak in tongues, and I could still speak in tongues. I was so confused. I said, they told me, if you get anything dirty in you, the Holy Ghost, whee, he flies away. He's gone. <laughs> you better have a catapult to hit him and resuscitate him and put him back in you. But, you see, I was so confused. Because things that are not major were being preached. Okay, what if has, is every, everyone who is not a smoker, do they have a relationship with God? Everyone who is not drinking, do they have a relationship with God? So you see, you realize that there is something more to preach than just many of these things. So Philip preached Jesus to the eunuch. He preached Jesus to him. He did not preach to him, oh, you see, you need to be circumcised because the eunuch was Ethiopian. Oh, you need this to happen to you. You need this, you need this. No, he didn't preach those things. He preached Jesus. Let's read that in the, in the Amplified. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with a portion of Scripture, he announced to him the glad tidings, gospel of Jesus and about him. What Jesus came to do, what Jesus' life meant, that is the gospel. Praise the Lord. The substitution him dying for us, taking our place, that's the gospel. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's go on. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? This shows that in his explanation of the gospel, he must have touched the issue of baptism. Because it is not Philip telling the man, you need to be baptized. It is the man who saw water and said, what hinders me from being baptized? That means this man had fully understood what Philip had preached. Fully understood what Philip had preached. Because he found him reading from Isaiah. And he said, how can I understand unless somebody interprets to me? But you see, that is the importance of us being so full of the Holy Ghost. This Philip here, was Philip was called as one of the deacons to serve food. One of the seven that were called to serve food. This is not the other apostle. This is not a, a, another prophet. He's just among those Philip, Stephen. The guys that Peter said, let's choose seven men full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost to come and distribute food. Because people were complaining about unfair distribution. And imagine because he was full of the Holy Ghost. Look at how he would present the gospel in that instant that somebody understood so clearly that they could request for baptism on their own. Man, that has to be the power of the Holy Ghost. That has to be conviction that came from the Holy Ghost. This was not a Bible school. You see, many Bible school, many Bible school graduates just confuse you when they preach. You see, it is the Holy Ghost who brings conviction. That is why we really need to rely on him. You can learn all the art of preaching. You can learn the art of speech. But these results that we see in the book of Acts, these were people hooked to the Holy Ghost. And that is why we see the results that we see among the people that they spoke to. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They didn't even have the New Testament, yet he preached Jesus in the portion that this man was reading in the Old Testament. That is why it is so sad when people say, oh no, the Old Testament, we don't want the Old Testament. It is just that you're not hooked with the Holy Ghost. Because these guys used it to preach Jesus. Paul used it to preach Jesus. He told Timothy, study. Which scripture was Timothy going to study? The Torah. They didn't yet have the New Testament. And said Philip, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Imagine, this is how much he had understood. <laughs> yeah? He's not telling him to repeat what he believes. The man himself is saying what he believes. This had happened. That's why I normally say that when you get born again, you, do, you see today, because of lack of power, we've learned the art of speech. You know, we, definitely it's important for preachers. There are people who have been taking through the class. It's important we learn the pulpit, the art of pulpit speech. That is so important. But if it just remains an art, no lives are going to be changed. That is why we always have to be, you see, you may not feel it, but you're born again. You may not, no, 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 no. Where is that power of conviction like this man experienced? That once I preach it, I don't need to, 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 to convince somebody. As you may not feel it, but you have it. That joy, I remember when I got born again. Where is that joy? Man, somebody says, Jesus, come into my life. And they open their eyes and they're like, I'm new. I'm new. They are happy. My sins are gone. They feel light. They feel like they can fly. What does that? It is preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why Jesus told them, tarry in Jerusalem until you endure with power. Tell them you're good. You know, you've heard how I preach, but that's not enough. You need to be endued with power. It is not in a multitude of words that you will get people born again. It is by the backing of the power of the Holy Spirit. That you even just speak one word. You speak one statement. And... Like he says in, 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 in John 16, from verse 8, he says, When he comes, he shall convict the world of sin. Praise the Lord. In verse 9, he says, Of sin, because they do not believe on him. Hallelujah. Of righteousness, because he goes to the Father. I mean, of righteousness, because... Of righteousness, because... Yeah, because he goes to the Father. And of judgment, because the evil one is defeated. It is the Holy Spirit who does this in us. It is the Holy Spirit who does this work in us. You know, when you understand this, Christianity cannot be boring. Christianity cannot be hard. Like he says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is easy and it is light. I've tested both. I've been out there in the world where I thought I was free. Where I thought Christians are bound. <laughs> then God this side and realized that I'm free. Praise the Lord. I realize that this life is so easy compared to living out there. You even wonder how do those people live out there who don't yet have Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that I have. Thank you for the freedom that I have. Like Paul says, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Like I have a right to choose. Praise the Lord. I've been made free that nothing is controlling me. Praise the Lord. That nothing is controlling me. That's the freedom. The freedom that he gives to us. Hallelujah. And he says, my yoke is easy. Yeah? And my burden is light. When you fully get to know him, you experience that. That is what the Holy Ghost does in us. So I believe this man, it is because Philip preached by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that he was able to understand that he should be baptized. And he said, he is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still and went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Praise the Lord. This guy had encountered God. He didn't even freak out that Philip was caught away. He went rejoicing. <laughs> you see, today, when Christians see supernatural works of God, they're like, that's the devil. Is that real? Is that of God? Because they are so foreign to the supernatural. So when something happens, ah, that is too much. That, that, that's weird. They say, that's spooky. That church, they, they, they are spooky. You see, a guy just came and is lame and they straightened out his leg. Mm, that's spooky. This guy, 
had a, you see the Holy Spirit bears witness in us. If you are a child of God, there are people, even here, there are people, there are things that were so new when you came to this ministry, but you didn't freak out. Why? Because you had encountered the Holy Spirit in some way, and your heart was in the right place. Yeah? And a number of people are like, mm, me, I've never seen people just speak in tongues like this, people slain like this, but when I got here, I was like, this is what I was longing for. I didn't know what I was longing for, but when I saw it, it didn't look spooky to me. It just looked like this is it. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yet there are those who have sat in church for 50 years and what, and they're like, hmm, hey, be careful. He just blew on them and they fell. How do you blow on people and they fall? And you know, now they go, they make a blog about blowing on people, they do what? They know nothing in scripture apart from knowing that blowing on people. Very trivial things. Yeah. Imagine what this man would have written about Philip. I, I, I thought he was a man of God until he just disappeared. And I was like, mm -mm, something is fishy here. <laughs> but the Bible says he went rejoicing. So this is another time we are seeing somebody being baptized. And you see they said they don't say when he saw a bottle of water, when he saw a cup of water. You see, they saw a pool of water. They saw a pond of water. Meaning it was, <laughs> it was for immersion. Because these guys normally moved with their water jars, their flasks. So if baptism was about that, he would have told him, ah, my jar is here. Why don't you baptize me? But he waited to see a lot of water. Praise the Lord. And now this is, I know this is a major thing among the Baptists. The Baptists really, they believe, that's why they are called Baptists. They came with water baptism so seriously, which is, which is a good thing. They restored a, a lost truth. Praise the Lord. And John was the first Baptist. He's the founder of the Baptist church. That's what you see. He's called John the Baptist. Hallelujah. And all that believe say amen. <laughs> so in all these times, we see it is not a requirement for you to be born again. Praise the Lord. But it is an outward experience. Just like Abraham in Romans 4, 8. Let's read Romans 4, 8 to 11. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only, or upon uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. And he might be the father of all them that believe. Through, uh, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Uh, this is the same thing with baptism. Abraham was not considered righteous. And you see, normally the things that God does, that's why it's important for us to preach Jesus. Because at times you take something that God has done, and as you go with it, you propagate it, you propagate it, you propagate it. You miss the root of the matter. And you stick there. You get what I'm saying? You miss the root of, 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 of the issue. And you stick on the, the end the, that's why he says that because of your traditions, you've made the word of God of none effect. That's how powerful human traditions are. I had this example from Smith Wigglesworth giving, explaining tradition in this mad sense. This lady was asked by her husband, why is it that you need to cut the steak before you put it in the oven? Why do you, because she would get the steak, cut off one piece, cut off this side, and put it in the oven. Then after making that, she gets these pieces and also makes them. And she said, I don't know, but my mom used to do that. So they met the mom and asked the mom, why do you cut the steak? Why do you have to cut off one side, cut off the other side? Why, why do you do that? Why do you do it twice? Why not put the whole thing in the oven? And the mom said, I don't know. That's how my mom used to do it. Luckily, the mom or the grandmom to this lady was still alive. So they asked her, so why, did you, why do you cut steak and put it in the oven? Why don't you put it once? And she said, in those days, our ovens used to be very small. The whole thing could not fit. 
So you see, the root was the size of the oven. So the root was totally kicked away, and they just continue with that tradition, just continue with that tradition. You get what I'm saying? It is the same way when, when foreigners came here to preach the gospel. They came and a lot of their dressing was so new to us, so offensive to us. So there were different conclusions. Now in Kenya, Mungiki, uh, not Mungiki, Mau Mau, these guys had dreadlocks. Why? Defiance as a sign of defiance. You get what I'm saying? And you see, when many of them got born again, they shaped them as, as a sign showing that we are out of that. But now you see, we come and we preach that. We preach that as the gospel. We preach that there is a problem with dreadlocks. What was the root? Am, am I putting them for defiance or for style? You get it? Next Sunday, if my beards are all dreadlocks, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> Don't come with Makasiriko. <laughs> you see, people, we, we miss so the traditions. That's how the traditions come. So it's the same way. The Jews took it on. They said, our father circumcised Abraham. And they said we should carry it on. So the emphasis was on circumcision, not believing in God. Abraham, it was a seal of his believing in God. So they didn't care whether you believe in God or not. Are you circumcised? That was it. And it is the same thing that we see in church even today. Praise the Lord. We see many things that people are told to do that are just, you don't even know where you got them from. Are you are not of age to take communion. Oh, young children are not given communion. Why? Mm, in our church, they are just not given communion. You get what I'm saying? You don't know why you do whatever you do. People just do whatever they do. I do, ah, you mean they preached before praise and worship? No, that's not how it's meant to be. Where? Where is that written? You've made the word of God of none effect because of your traditions. That's what he says. So it's the same thing. Some sects have taken, as important as baptism is, we are not saved because of baptism. There is a lot that you miss if you're not baptized. A lot. Just like speaking in tongues. There is a lot you miss if you don't speak in tongues. Praise the Lord. But you're not born again by speaking in tongues. Praise the Lord. You're not, not going to go to heaven because you don't speak in tongues. You may even go earlier. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, tongues release power for you to live longer. <laughs> so it's the same thing. So you, I, I've found Christians who... Like, oh, we are Christians and what? And the first question they ask, so when were you baptized? Where were you baptized? And you see, to them, if you are not baptized, you are not Christian. I like what they do because in the, in the early church, they really believed also. How can you be born again and not be baptized? It didn't make sense to them, but they didn't put baptism before. But it didn't make sense to them. That is why Paul meets these guys. And the baptism they know is the baptism of John. He says, no, 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 you have to be baptized again. They had to be baptized again. It was so crucial. It's like you've understood. It's, it, it's the same thing. Let's go to Romans 10. Romans 10. Let's read from verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that, in, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. If you will confess with your mouth. Let's go to verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, we've preached all over that you get born again by confessing. But that's not what this scripture says. <laughs> there is no receiving righteousness if you're not born again. But he's saying you receive righteousness by believing in your heart. No. How many of you saw Cornelius and his family confess? They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. Which is only for those who are born again. So when did Cornelius confess? Peter's sermon had not ended. He had not made the altar call. In Acts 10. Said, while I still yet speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, for we heard them speak in tongues. 
Peter was still going on. Bringing Greek, Hebrew, ropes on the stage. And the Holy Ghost is like, Peter, <laughs> that's too much. Guys are radiant. I believe as Peter spoke, these guys believed in their heart. And they were born again. And they were born again. So confession unto salvation, I've explained that over and over. And then, why do we require people to confess? Definitely it is an outward expression that they've believed in their heart unto righteousness. It is an outward, and it, 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 it's, it's, you see, whatever outward things we do, the outward things that God has told us to do, there is a way they seal or cement that that we have believed. They are a witness. You see, a witness establishes something. It is real, but a witness establishes it. That is why you go and you, you're told, ah, now you see you've paid, uh, you go to what? KWS. And say, ah, for children this, for this person this amount. So you pay. You've paid, it's true. But you stay there and get your receipt. Why? The receipt is a witness. It establishes that you paid. So a lot that God has told us, just like we do fasting. Fasting is an outward expression of the posture of our hearts. Where we are. Praise the Lord. But it's already decided in our heart. That's why it's possible for somebody to fast and totally miss it. If inside it's not that way. And it's possible for somebody to confess and not be born again. Because it is just blabbing. It's just lips from the lips. Confession means saying the same thing. So that's the same thing that's in the heart. Hallelujah. And so like this, people get born again. Even this confession prayer that we make, this is not even 600 years old. In the early church, we don't even see that in the, in the Bible. Do you ever see anyone else? Now Paul preached, or Peter, Philip preached in Samaria and said, guys, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Is it a wrong thing? No, it's not a wrong thing. Definitely as we grow, God gives us better ideas on how to do... You see, I can't say that what we are doing today is wrong, but this was not there in the early church, that you came and service had this order, then there was somebody to preach. No. When they met, whoever had a hymn, you started singing. So you can imagine how many people didn't know to sing. So later we realize, eh, many people who don't know how to sing are singing a lot. We better have an order. We better have a worship team. <laughs> <laughs> eh? Many times when somebody volunteers to sing, many times it's the ones that are off key that volunteer. Anyone give us a number? <laughs> you just hear what you never. Um, eh? I am afraid of God. Mm. <laughs> so even this, even, 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 even salvation. Even getting born again, this is an outward thing that follows. But yet it is so powerful. And that is why many of you, when you went through that confession prayer, by the time you said amen, you felt like you are a new person. But you see the decision was made while you were seated there, before even the altar call was made, you decided in your heart. What if you decided in your heart at that time, then Al-Shabaab hit that church? So you're not born again? <laughs> You had made the decision to follow him. Praise the Lord. But you see, when you came and did it outwardly, man, it just took you higher. There is a lot that the devil lost. He has no claim on you. Just like I was talking about the receipt, it is the same thing like a land title. You can pay for the land and you're told it is yours. But you see, when you get the land title, there are many devils you keep off. Those ones who are fenced near you, though every devil there can't just get into you. You have the land title. So the outward things we do, there is, as in, first of all, there is accountability. You know, people have seen you being baptized. So when they find you out there acting fun, they're like, you, you're born again. Are you not born again? But you see, if it is just a secret to you, ah, they just, ah, there is a guy there. People need to be born again. <laughs> but you see now, <laughs> it's here before people. And you see somebody... <laughs> Somebody has ever requested me if they could be baptized privately. (laughs) 
They also had a preacher saying, ah, uh, 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 that he was told by a certain one, a millionaire there in the US, I've got born again, but can you come? I have an indoor swimming pool in my house. Just come at night, and my children are in bed, and what, and you just, we just do it. You just, <laughs> just baptize me there. No, 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 no. It is an outward proclamation of your faith, and there is power in that. There is power in it being outward. And that is why most people I lead to Christ, most people I've preached to for the first time, I tell them, tell the first three people you meet what has happened to you. Because there is fear it breaks. You see, outward, when you do things outwardly, there is fear it breaks, and then it marks you. Everyone knows it marks you. You build a house in which shall go. Your family used to be laughed at as poor and what? You throw a party to open the house. You get it? You call all the neighbors. Ah, tuta chinja ngombe, tuta. You know, you, what are you doing? It is not celebrating. It is showing. <laughs> We've done it to Memaliza. Then when you give your speech, you just talk about how much the house cost and what. So that you gain some relevance on that village. Now if the world does such things, why shouldn't we do such things for our faith? For this that we have believed. That is what baptism, baptism does that. Hallelujah. It does not save us, but it is so important for this. It is because we believe. It is because we believe that we, we go through this. And water baptism is something that every believer or every born again person should go through. Yeah? It is an experience that is necessary. Very necessary. I know many of us have gone through it, but it, it, it is so necessary because of the power, whatever Christ told us, just like our selling, like the way we do communion, that, like it's one, the, part of the New Testament sacraments. Now, sacraments is not a Catholic word. But part of the New Testament, like those, what should I say, ceremonies or what that he gave to us. He gave communion. He gave baptism. Yeah? These are very, very key. They are very key. He didn't give them just for the sake of giving them. He didn't, you know, you may think, ah, that was the early church. They didn't have many programs. They didn't have a lot to do. And Jesus thought, ah, now what will they be doing the rest of the week? Baptize. No, it was not that way. It was so powerful. Water baptism is out of personal revelation of what the finished work of Christ has done in us and for us. Yeah? And the relationship we have with him today. It is from that. I understand. And that is why I was asking people that are being baptized here. Yeah? Do you really believe that your old man, that old nature, bound to sin and all that, do you believe that he was buried with Christ? And when Christ was raised, he didn't come up. That man stayed there. So as you get under this water, you are declaring this publicly. Old man, you have no hold on me anymore. Dev and your cohorts, no hold on me anymore. This is how you were buried with Christ. And when he came up, he came up a new man. And I come out of this water to declare that I'm a new man. I come up in that newness of life. And you see, because it is an act of faith, it has power. I know people who had tattoos they didn't want. Tattoos that... I have nothing against tattoos. Praise the Lord. I myself, I have many. They are still in the tattoo sh store, the tattoo shop. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm going to put them on the body soon. That they are, they are, they are mine. You get it? See, that's what I'm saying. I have many. So you didn't ask where. They are in the store. They are still in the tattoo shop. But... These were, these were not, they were like maybe evil tattoos, tattoos he had because of evil intention and what? Permanent. And now today, you know, tattoos are removed by laser nowadays. You get it? But you pay, you pay money. And at times still, there is a way you can still see what's on the body. But this guy came out of the water, no tattoo. New skin. You get what I'm saying? Remember when we were baptizing who? Ivy. She had ulcers. She never used to eat even pineapples and what? That's the baptism we had at that school. What's that school called? Where? What's that school? Kimathi. Yeah. 
And she came out of the water, and she was healed, and bought a pineapple there and then, and ate. And up to tomorrow, she is free. Got out of that water. Uh, there is another gentleman here. What is his name? Owen. Owen, him, he was even very conscious about things of speaking in tongues. Because they used to come and they were not so sure about many things that happened here as a group. So we were, that's the camp we were at CMM. Baptized him, came out of the water and he's speaking in tongues. Asked him, oh, Owen, when did you start speaking in tongues? Because I knew it was something. I was like, now. <laughs> Powerful. Because you release your faith. You release your faith. Praise the Lord. It is an act of faith. And that is the same way you get born again and you say, from today, I will follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I belong to you. Amen. And man, you're free. You walk out of that place and you're like, what? I prayed that prayer and I knew I was a new man. And you see, nowadays it's been watered down because we're not preaching in power. We're not preaching expecting instant results. Today we preach and we're like, mm, you will change, you will change, you will change. You see, everything today is about here, about process. We, we write off the miracle power of God. But you see that, 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 that songs that, the songs that, the songs that were sung during that time, of you see when we sing at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the days these guys believed that and it had happened to them he remembers that day when he was all come to the cross of jesus he remembers that burden rolling away he doesn't sleep anymore waking up. Wow, what if I sin tomorrow? What if? No, that burden rolled away in that instant. Today we preach to people as if it can't happen. So sad. People came and hit the altar and they got out of that altar all their addictions. Lost. Totally lost in an instant. My granddad, he got born again at 80. He was a tough man. I've talked about him here. He was a soldier. He, he, was in, he, he was in World War II. Maybe whatever he saw affected him. I don't know. But he was in Bombay, India. They, they ate toads. They ate things that they, they, were, they, were, they never used to eat in Uganda because of war. It was a tough time. So either that's what changed him or he was, but he was a tough man. He was, he was well. He was, he was a paramedic also. So even he used to treat us. <laughs> Hey, his injection was painful. <laughs> Benji, do you have a fever? No. <laughs> you see, that's <laughs> hey. But he he loved, like he, he loved, but not in a soft way. You get it? One time my mom told me she came from school. My mom was in one of the best schools in the country, if not the best school at that time in the country. So he was willing to part with money for such things. Very good school. She goes home for Easter. They were given, go home for the Easter break. After the Easter break, he tells her, thank you for seeing us. And he gives her nothing. He said, no, you had money to come and see us. Nothing. You get know what I'm saying? Nothing to carry from home. Not that he could not afford, but that, you know, that's what I mean. Many people who disappointed him at his old age, first of all, he was, very, he was a very healthy man because he was disciplined. He died at 85 without ever losing a tooth or having a tooth refilled. He was very keen to brush his teeth every after a meal. Say amen to that. Even the men say amen to that. <laughs> Huh? He could still ride a bicycle, a motorbike at 85 for distance, so he was so strong. He still, I think he's what, some of the, he had some of the weapons, but some I think were taken by the government, but he still had an arrow and a bow. And I'm telling you, if he got you on his land, he didn't fear. At 82, he goes out, he has things on his land, he goes out, he carries his arrow with his dog. Very serious man. 
But when he got born again at 80, he changed. He changed. You know, people in that village feared to step on his land. He had his own water well, as in we were just so self-sufficient. Up to today, I don't know our neighbors in Aushago because of that. Because when we went, we had enough field for us with our cousins to play football there. He gave us newspapers. He gave us the radio. He had books for us to read. You see, Yolo is wanted us to read. He spoke to us in English. He, he was a proper, like, the English, English people had thoroughly rubbed on him. You get it? He's done, how do you hold that fork? How do you, you know, he was, he was that straight, proper man. But, so we didn't know all those people because those people, many feared him. We also, our land was very big. So by the time you walk from our land going to the neighbor, as kids it was hard. But when he got born again, he would ride his bicycle, visit people. Children who had disappointed him, like they are, like what? His like nieces or what people he's taking care of, they got babies before when they were in school and what you see? giving up on them. He does shopping for them. He wants to go see those babies. As in his last five years, he was a totally, totally different man. Totally different man. It was not a process like we prepare. He got born again today and tomorrow everyone could see the change in him. Praise the Lord. That is the power of the gospel that I'm talking about. It is still available. So many of these outward things we do, it is the same thing. You get out of that water. Refuse to be the same. I got out of that water. I refuse to be the same. I was 14 years of age. I didn't speak in tongues that very day, but I really thought I would speak in tongues that very day. I prayed. I'd never had grace to pray like that. That time I prayed. I just felt like there was something different. I felt like I'd been marked for eternity when I came out of that water at 14. And a few months later, I was filled with the Holy Ghost alone. No one laid hands on me and what. But it, it's, it was from that outward experience. Because it's my dad who baptized me. So hearing him ask me those questions, I'm like, does he know me? Benji, do you really believe Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm like, we came from the same house with you. Like, you get that's what I'm thinking. But I looked at his face and he was serious. So I became serious. And those questions became very serious to me, whatever he asked me. Then he baptized me. <laughs> Yeah, but it was a very awesome moment and it should be for those that have been baptized and those who will be baptized later. And water baptism is an outward declaration, like I'm saying, that we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and are now in union with him. It involves the spiritual and symbolic act of us going down under water and rising up again. Hallelujah. And it is the same way that Paul explains in Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Let's read in the message version. When we, were, when we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus when we are raised up out of the water. It is like the resurrection of Jesus. It is like the resurrection of Jesus. You've resurrected. When Jesus resurrected, he was no longer limited to earthly elements. Now for you, it may not necessarily be earthly elements, but it may be elements from the world that you came from, the bondage that you came from. How many of us before were born again? How many struggled with lust and you feared? You wanted to really be free. How many struggled with lying? How many struggled with drugs? How many struggled with just insecurity, greed, pride, things that you struggled with? Even you got born again and you're like, you, you, you're just like, oh, tomorrow let this not happen again. Let you, you know. You know, many of you know Pastor Otim, he's ministered here. After I led him to Christ, I knew Pastor Otim because that time he was on drugs, he was on what? He was, like I may not say short-tempered, but just ruthless. 
like careless with his emotions, I should say that. You get it? So one time, <laughs> one of our friends has, you know, grab you take. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was peanuts or what. This is high school. He breaks the guy's case and removes the peanuts. Distributes, we start eating. And now this is just before he's born again. And the guy comes. And the guy was the one, he made this guy feel like he's done in the wrong. Like, how can you? People are here hungry and peanuts and you. And you see, he's. He's. He has nothing to hide about it. You get what I'm saying? Like he gave you a piece of his mind in case you did something. So you see, he gets born again and, hey, Benji, do you have a Bible? Yes, I have a Bible. He carries this big Bible. And you know, I'm just so cautious. I'm thinking, wow, what if people make fun of him? Won't he just throw the Bible and you get it? <laughs> and resurrect. <laughs> Imagine people made fun of him. People did things. People end. That man was dead. He just seemed to be a loser and it didn't bother him. Whatever I said of him, he was made fun of. He was just a loser. I'm like, that's the newness. The old man had been buried. Totally buried. And he was here new. Very gentle to people. He was not gentle. Sharing. We used to fast with him. Man, God took us through Bible school. Young people. We were, what, well, that time we were in Form 5, 17. And we used to fast Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So now we used to ah, so we used to save money because now we are fasting those days. Then as we read, isn't this the fast I want? That the day you fast, you share your food with. So now we started calculating the money we used to spend. And we'd always look for someone who didn't have anything for break and we would give. And always, without any contention. Totally new man. Totally new man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And... If you're not baptized and you're going to be baptized, this is the faith you should have. That as you get in this water, you don't come out the same. You endorse that. It's true the man was buried with Christ, but you're outwardly declaring it. It is a stand of faith that you are making. Hallelujah. And Colossians 2.13 and you, being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together or made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He's quickened together with you. So see, you come out thinking about these things, yeah? In baptism, we are consciously identifying with our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, and declaring that we have all the blessings of his perfect, complete work. Yeah? We declare that we who were once dead because of our sins are now alive in Christ. Hallelujah. And as we see, as we see uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, all things are passed away. You are a new creature. We see the Lord's great love for us in everything he did for us through his death, burial and resurrection, water baptism is also a time of celebrating his love. This love that he has for us, during this time you, you're celebrating that love, that love that he has for us, and that we are celebrating it before many witnesses. We are celebrating this before many witnesses, that we want people to see what the Lord has done. And while it is a celebration and an outward declaration of what happened in us when we received Jesus as our Savior, we have also seen many precious people experience inward transformation as they take the step of faith, like some of the things that I've been sharing with you. Yeah? We've seen them supernaturally delivered from bad habits, addictions, and walk in newness of life. Hallelujah. So I believe that is like, so if, if maybe it makes even many of us that were baptized earlier, it makes this baptism have more sense, praise the Lord, to us. And it is important for us to, 
to continue affirming that every other day, that I was raised to the newness of life. There is a newness of life. If you want a clue of the newness of life, we have a few teachings on, on YouTube on eternal life. And you can ask for the audios. I think we have all the audios. Eternal life. Listen to eternal life. Eternal life is not just life that never ends. Eternal life is not life you're just going to have when you get to heaven. It is life that starts now. It is the newness of life. That life without these limitations that the devil had put on you. A life of power. Praise the Lord. A life of freedom. A life of knowing him. He says in John 17, 3, this is eternal life. That they might know you as the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That that is eternal life. They may experience you as God. It is so sad that many people know their church more than they know God. They know church rituals more than they know God. That's not eternal life. You may know how, oh, as Christians, we don't do. You know, many people normally ask, is it right for a Christian to do this? Whatever is not right for a Christian to do is not right for anyone to do. That's God's order. I say, is it right for a Christian to be polygamous? It's not right for anyone to be polygamous. I follow God. Whatever God was putting, he wasn't putting for Christians. He wasn't saying this is for Christians, this is not for Christians. So people ask, oh, is it okay for a Christian to do this? It's not okay for anyone. Is it okay for a Christian to steal? It's not okay for anyone to steal. Praise the Lord. So there is this new life, the life that God intended for us. This life of power, life of freedom, a life of knowing him, a life of experiencing him. That every day, as you remember this, as you remember that you are buried with him, that you will live to this new life. When you see the devil trying to roam around you, you just remember as raised to newness of life. The devil has nothing in me. Like Jesus said, the prince of this world has nothing in me. He has no hold on me. He has no bait in me. Praise the Lord. The every, every stronghold of his was broken. Praise the Lord. There is no claim he has on me. There is a time he used to have a claim on me. Oh, you did this. Oh, you did this. Christ came and broke that. In Colossians, he says, the message version says, he blotted away the handwriting of these ordinances that were against us. It was blotted away. Blotted away. Let's read. Let's, let's read Colossians. Let's go to chapter 2. Let's read chapter 2 from verse... Let's just read from verse 10. I read through very fast. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sin, of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the, circum the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all the trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Let's read that in the message. The slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant cancelled and nailed to the cross, to Christ's cross. No arrest warrant anymore. Because that's what the devil comes with. You. No, no, no. You can't have a good marriage. This has happened. You can't have a good business. This has happened. You can't enjoy. You can't lift hands and worship God. You're not holy. You can't. He says that warrant nailed to the cross. Praise the Lord. Taken to the cross by Christ Jesus. No more hold on you. So when we sing and say he has no hold on, we sing, we sing, actually I think we should sing it. Let worship team come and we sing it. We should sing what? Living hope. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Praise the Lord. He set us free. That when you're saying he set us free, you mean it. He set us free. Praise Jesus. Many Christians sing such songs, but they are not a reality. And because they are not a reality, many have come to believe that they can't be a reality. They believe these are just good songs to sing. Praise Jesus. But they are not just good songs to sing. They are powerful songs. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord. Let's get up on our feet and let's sing this song together.